Welcome into the Original Gangsters podcast. I am your host, Scott Bernstein, along with my co-conspirator and uh, partner in crime, uh, the Dr. Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. Hey, now. Uh, and we got Ben behind the glass. Uh, this week, we're going to uh, really get into a deep dive of one of the most consequential, um, most historically significant undercover operations in the history of law enforcement's war on organized crime and the mafia. Um, we're gonna be talking to a, a true American hero, uh, a guy that was a pioneer in uh, the ability for law enforcement to infiltrate the mafia at levels they had never done before. He was involved uh, in, in stomping out mob uh, corruption in politics and police uh, out of uh, Stamford, Connecticut, which was always, in, to this day still is a big outpost for um, Genovese and Gambino crime families from New York. Uh, and I wanna welcome in uh, Vito Colucci, who is, uh, again, we, we pay a debt to people like this. He's an OG law enforcement and uh, his work uh, led to a Pulitzer for, for some reporters, as well as the, the, uh, the spawning of the Presidential Commission on Organized Crime uh, under Ronald Reagan. Vito, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Well, like Ronald Reagan would say, evil is powerless if the good are unafraid. Yes. We had that. We had that. And, and Vito, uh, I, I like to explain to people when talking about Vito's uh, story and journey and narrative that, you know, for fans of pop culture and, and the film world, he was literally living this um, cross section of Serpico and Copland. Um, you know, Serpico was the Sidney Lumet movie from the from the 70s, and then Copland was the great Sylvester Stallone, uh, Ray Liotta, Robert De Niro movie um, in uh, the 90s, and they were both about sniffing out uh, corruption in police departments, and Vito uh, wrote an, a, a, one of the all-time great books when it comes to uh, a story of the cops going undercover into the mob and, and breaking up uh, big organized crime and it's, uh, organized crime racket and conspiracy. It's, it's the 10 year anniversary of that book. It's one of my favorites. It's called Rogue Town um, and was written, uh, co-authored uh, with, with Dennis Griffin, who I uh, have gotten to know in, in my lifetime and is just, you know, salt of the earth, uh, great author. And then we have on the podcast right now, two people that I want to quickly bring in um, and get some words from before we jump back to Vito and uh, uh, really start kind of to, to tell the story of his journey. Um, so we got Joe Cochran, who is a, a, another a friend of mine and hopefully will become a friend of the show. Uh, Joe's in Detroit and uh, Joe helped uh, Vito with the 10 the year anniversary of the book was commemorated by a a second edition that has some additional reporting that Joe helped on. So Joe, thank you for uh, jo joining us and helping Vito tell a story. It's good to be here. It's quite a story. Uh, not only do I consider Vito a very good friend and a hero to America, he is, he's my idol and hero. He's like an older brother to me, but I am, I am just so honored to be working on this and then hopefully uh, some more books down the road. And then uh, let's, oh, let's, Really quickly, uh, bring in uh, Vito's son-in-law, Gary, who is a chaplain for uh, the police out in Illinois. And, you know, it, it was by a grace of, uh, you know, the heavens above, uh, Vito is with us today to tell the story. But uh, over the last couple of years, he had some health issues and, you know, was at uh, on the brink. And he credits his son-in-law with helping get him through that. So, you know, his son, Gary's got to, to jet in a little bit, but let's just bring him on real quick and uh, say hi to Gary and uh, just kind of maybe tell a little bit about what you two have been through the last year or two. Yeah. Uh, well, well, thank you, Scott. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Vito keeps defying the odds. Hey, every cop needs a chaplain with him. Um, and Vito, uh, we were told wouldn't be here. Uh, we just celebrated uh, his year anniversary of life. Uh, you know, he laid unresponsive in the hospital, uh, no hope, no diagnosis. The way that it was described to us, it was a perfect storm of all that went wrong. Uh, and, and really, we had no way to communicate with him because he couldn't communicate. 
And so, you know, we had to do what we do best, and that's just to uh, activate our faith um, and just hang on and fight the good fight of faith for him. Uh, he's sitting here today. He's in a fairly good shape. He has his moments, uh, but just a real uh, encouragement to those who might be struggling. I mean, this really is a, is a story of hope. Um, and coming back from uh, from something that was impossible. And isn't it also kind of a microcosm of the work he was doing where the odds were stacked against him? It's an uphill climb. Everybody was probably questioning whether or not he could get the job done. And at the end of the road, after this lengthy time undercover, he busts open one of the biggest, you know, mob corruption cases in, in American history. So it's really a, a, a tribute to his perseverance in both earlier in life and in the last year. Yeah, absolutely. The parallel was uncanny. Uh, and we had to keep reminding the hospital staff, even though he was unresponsive, we said, this man matters. He mattered and he still matters. Uh, and you don't know what this man has been through. So we're not giving up, we're not pulling the plug, but we're gonna stay the course and we know there's gonna be a breakthrough. And there was. I didn't even know that the like, first three weeks I was in the hospital, I was in a coma out of the nine weeks I was in there and I had everything. And Gary came, took charge, told the doctors off a little bit and uh, I feel great. That's awesome, that's amazing. Um... So, you know, let's just kind of jump in and, you know, Vito, just to give the quick primer again, uh, Stanford Police Department in Stanford, Connecticut was a beehive of corruption, organized crime activity, payoffs, uh, gangsters being shielded uh, by investigations, gangsters in some ways controlling who got, not in some ways, in a lot of ways, controlling who got promoted, who got assignments within the police department. And uh, it reminded me again of, of Copland um, where they, they had a fictional town uh, called Garrison, New Jersey. But in that town, well, Sylvester Stallone, that character, which I, and again, I digress, but I think it's Stallone's best acting performance of the latter part of his career or the second half of his career, you know, plays a, a meek, sheriff that's completely puppeted um, by the mafia and these and these uh, cops uh, that were dirty. So Vito saw this and he didn't just, you know, talk about it, uh, you know, with, with, in a coffee clash with his, with his buddies, he decided to do something about it and put his, his mouth where his, where his uh, words were and, and went deep undercover. You know, Vito, tell us about the, the kind of the, the impetus for, uh, uh, for the investigation and your work? Well, you know, what happened was when you're new on the police department, they put you in a squad car each day with a different man, okay, to pick the good thing from him and put away the, the not good. I was realizing that whoever they put me with was depressed and say, you know, everything's bad here, man, just mind your business the whole bit. Uh, and I couldn't understand it. Then when I got put on a narcotic squad, and after, after a shootout that unfortunately uh, we were in, uh, we started to realize that in arresting this individual, Arville Chapman, and he asked if we can go to the prosecutors and get him off if he gave us something very big. I said, well, I'm all ears, what do you got? He says, your boss, Larry Hogan, runs the whole empire for the whole county, Fairfield County, Connecticut, which encloses Stanford and Greenwich, is the richest. Maybe there's a, you know, a California, they have a, one or two places, but it, it encompasses Greenwich. All the movie stars live there, ball players from the New York teams and everything. And everybody's greedy and they're money hungry, unfortunately. So we said, our bill, tell us. He said, well, your boss Hogan, he's running the whole thing. And I work for him and your sergeant, Duke Morris runs all the narcotics through the whole county and everything else. And that was amazing. We, uh, we infiltrated this, uh, found all the evidence on what was going on. Unfortunately, there was uh, Anthony Dolan who wrote the book, won a Pulitzer for it, uh, found out that there was eight dirty cops in Stanford. 
uh, we had about 300 guys on the police department. Stanford was a, uh, uh, a town of about 130, 140 people. So it was a decent sized town, very rich town, okay? And then all the, I always tell people, there's three, there was three cities in the country that worked uh, uh, bringing in the, the companies, organized crime uh, took them in. It was uh, Chicago, New York City, and Stanford, Connecticut. They'd bring their headquarters in, they'd build there. And the, the, the common knowledge uh, after my interviews was that they would tell you if you were one of the contractors, uh, Scott, they'd say, okay, uh, the bids are going to go till June 15th. Call me on June 14th. I'll tell you what's the lowest bid at that time. You come in a million dollars under that, and you got it. We chop it up, and you could get the contract for it. And, and these were big. Just uh, I just want to clarify. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Vlito, yeah, but just for right. the audience, just for the audience, so they understand, you're talking about Fortune 500 companies, yeah, big Xerox, corporate entities, Xerox, that were moving to Stanford. Yep, all the major companies wanted to come into Stanford, Connecticut. And there was a lot of money there, a lot of money to be made. And the bad guys jumped in and they wanted their cut too, you know? And that was one part of it, what they did. They controlled all appointments, all um, things with the cops. If you were uh, going to try to be the lieutenant on the police department, you're studying. You come in number one on the test out of 40, 40 guys, they'd, uh, they'd go down to three or four if they wanted the, three, the guy at three or four to come in who had the connections, okay? And they weren't afraid of anything. The chief at that time was not a good chief at all. Uh, you had nobody that you could go to. When we started to log our information, our evidence, I said to my partner, Joe Legi, I said, Joe, can we go to the state police? No, no, they got too many hooks there. We can't. How about the FBI? No, the chief and the captain, those uh, guys there. What are we going to do with this? Just hold on to it, see what happens. And what happened was a new police chief came in from California, Chizankis, who laid that big six foot six former Marine that did the same thing out in California. He, uh, he went undercover with a guy. And they got the evidence and the same thing. He, he knocked the ball out of the park. And so he came and uh, we, we finally, the end result was 15 people indicted. Some cops, uh, a sitting senator that was running for governor the next year. And uh, it just continued to go like that. We had death threats, it was unbelievable. Uh, Anthony Dolan wrote 75 stories for the local newspaper wins the Pulitzer, the, the Academy Award of Writing. He wins the Pulitzer, goes on to uh, Ronald Reagan, finds out about the story. He asked to see him in 1980. He hires him as, as his, um, um, well, he, he um, Anthony Dolan uh, became his writer, excuse me, became his writer for all his speeches and everything else for the full eight years. Went on to work then for both Bushes in a capacity. And, uh, you know, it was, it was amazing, amazing how these things all happened. And, uh, and Anthony yeah. Dolan wrote, he wrote the forward to Rogue Town, just for people. Yes. Uh, yeah, he wrote knowledge. the forward, an amazing forward about it all, everything else. Back then, Rudy Giuliani was new. There was a lot of people that were new. And, uh, he, he was amazing. If he, I, I don't even know what would have happened if he didn't come to Stanford, Connecticut and come as a cub reporter and dig, digged and digged and digged and found out all the evidence that some of them, which I turned over to him, some of which the good people of Stanford, the honest people turned over to him. And it was amazing because just like the cover says, the Stanford, Connecticut story served as the catalyst for President Ronald Reagan's initiative against the American mafia and the establishment of the President's Commission on Organized Crime. Back in that day, I'm a little older than you folks, back in that day, uh, the President would take over all the channels if he wanted to uh, give a, a news conference, all the, ma the major channels. And he would say there, he said, well, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna hire 400 more prosecutors. I'm gonna hire six, hundred more 
of this and that, and we're going after the organized crime. And that really was the first time, like he says, that we, the cops were always behind organized crime, meaning that they never were even with them. Okay, organized crime was always ahead of them. This was the first time that the police got, prosecutors got even with them, and the time that they even got ahead of the game against organized crime. So that's that's why uh, you know the book was uh, so interesting to people and every, everything of that nature. But uh, it was it was terrible. I had death threats uh, at night um, after working the organized crime thing. I had to walk my door with a gun in my pocket and everything. But thank God, I got out of it and uh, no, no harm to myself. Try to explain to people that aren't from the East Coast. Um, you know, you, you hear Stanford, Connecticut, and it seems like it's a minor league town, and that if it's not in Manhattan or the Brooklyn or the Bronx, it's it's uh, somehow less than. But what's going on? I mean, even today, like I'm saying, I mean, for kind of time immemorial, uh, what's going on in Connecticut because of its proximity to New York City, it's very valuable racket territory. Um, maybe just give a quick minute or two for people to understand that this was an outpost for the Genovese and for the Gambinos that was looked at on equal status of if you control territory in Queens or you control territory in Staten Island, the territory that was in Connecticut was as important, if not more important than some of that New York City territory. Yeah, probably a, a big reason for that was there was a lot more money during that time in Stanford, Connecticut, Greenwich, Connecticut was the place. You know, the movie stars, everybody lived there. The, all the ball players from all the New York teams, like I said, lived there. And little by little, all these guys came in. I, I, I was looking at my paperwork here, all the names of all these guys that came in and took over, be it from Gambino or Genovese families, uh, murdering each other, doing all that stuff. Uh, it, it was horrible. People, you know, I learned a lot. I, I, I uh, for a while when Henry Hill was alive, I spoke a lot of engagements with him, and it, it was interesting because um, <laughs> you know we'd go to a place and and, and talk, and somebody be walking up out, out way uh, in the hallway or something. They see Henry Hill, and they call, "Hey, you rat!" and they run away like that. So one time, I just stopped everybody. I said, "Hold on." And we had a lot of about four or 500 people there. I said, please answer this question for me. If you're arrested and they're telling you, Scott, you're definitely going away for 11 years. No ifs, ands, or buts, unless you help me. What are you going to do? Can you please raise your hand if you're still going to be quiet and not do anything? Nobody. Most people would, would fold under question. And then we were talking uh, off the air. Jimmy and I have talked about this on, uh, on you know, this platform. One of the most underappreciated aspects of when you're looking at this, especially now, everybody talks. Everybody in the mob from the very top to the very bottom is talking in some way, shape or form to the government. Um, so the belief that, you know, that there are just these, you know, full of, of rats that have actually taken the stand, that doesn't mean there aren't thousands of other guys that have given other people up, yeah. that, that have gotten them arrested, have gotten them put in prison. They're just not identified. They're what we call, you know, dry snitches. Um, and, and, and the and people don't realize, Scott, the people don't realize that after the cops interview these guys, they go, they think they're going to go back to the clubhouse. No, yeah. they walk in the clubhouse. What did you do? Oh, I didn't tell them nothing. They don't believe him. Either that guy's going to get killed or he's going to get thrown out and tell them, don't you come back here anymore. They're not going to be believed anyway. A lot of times what we would do if we arrested somebody and it was a real wise ass and he was not telling us anything, we'd say, okay, come on, let's drop, his, drop you back off. We, we pull up to the clubhouse. We get out. <laughs> And, you know, it's like, Tony, thank you very much, man. Thank you for all your help. What are you talking about? Thank you. Pat him on the back. And, you know, <laughs> hey, something happens to the guy. It's not my fault. I'm just thanking him for coming in, you know? 
Um, uh, Scott had has that purple gang pedigree, so I bet Scott uh, <laughs> he would he would uh, subscribe to Omerta. I bet keep his mouth shut. <laughs> my yeah, Vito, my my uh, my great grandfather's first cousins were uh, the the infamous purple gang here in Detroit, which was oh, Jewish, yeah. Jewish mob. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's a couple names I want to throw at Vito, uh, guys that were kind of the head of the snake when it came to Genovese crime family affairs in Stamford. Uh, lesser known guys, but, you know, in terms of if you were studying the five families and the guys that were doing stuff in the Big Apple, but in terms of the history of Connecticut, guys like John Stuji DiPoli and Michael uh, Ginzo, uh, uh, Zizima, Joe Tamburi. These were guys that were, you know, the shot that the mafia shot callers in Stanford and the ones that were, uh, you know, had their hooks into the police department, guys like Larry Hogan. Um, Vito, you know, what do you remember about guys like Stuji? You know, Stuji was the man. He was the big guy in Stanford and all through uh, Fairfield County. He was the one that um, he was a quiet type of guy. You see him for promotions. Everything was kind of in a way we had a, 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 a place in town where it was a, a little bit of a, a, a diner off the wall, off near the water and the whole bit. And, the, and actually the cops, I remember a couple of times they brought me as a young cop. They say, come on, we're going to go to the, the diner. I'm going to meet with Stoogie. You go sit over there and get a hamburger or whatever you want. And they would go to negotiate. Or, you know, uh, well, what are you going to do for me if I make you lieutenant and things of that nature, you know, and, and it was it was just uh, unbelievable. Stuji uh, was a guy and he didn't like me when I was he, when I did my undercover stuff and everybody. He hated me at that time. My mom was working. All of a sudden, I go to my mom's house one day and I see all this new furniture at my mother's house. New kitchen set, beautiful uh, style for that that era. And I said, where did all this stuff come from? She says, oh, she's right from Italy. She said, oh, wait a minute, I got the paper over here. Uh, see the name over here, Mr. DiPoli? Because I, I, I watch his mother. And so he wanted to do, I said, you watch his mother? Yeah, yeah, she's real old and I take care of her. I didn't know that, you know, at the time. And so he sent his boys, <laughs> bought her all new kitchen set and everything. Make sure you tell your son. Now, make sure you tell your son what I did. I said, Ma, what did you do? These people are no good. No, what am I going to I didn't know. So I was really furious with that. that that's for sure. Because uh, gave her all the furniture. Now, my mom would go over to her house, the old lady's house. She was about 80 years old at that time and take care of her. And so I guess that was his way to, mm, you know, get even with me a little bit. And uh, uh, Vito, tell the story from the book. This was one of my favorite stories uh, about your first day on the job going undercover. <laughs> and you bought yourself a new watch from like a Sears. And just tell, tell, tell the story about how you got a lesson and how to dress like a mob guy. Well, uh, here I am, I, I, I go, I meet with the FBI. Uh, they had a big office in Stanford at the time. I met with them and, and finally it was my day to come in and get wired up and to go out on the road myself. So I go in and back then you got to understand the boxes were big. You know, they tape it to your back. They got the wires all over your body, the whole thing like that. You don't want somebody to give you a big bear hug or something like that because they, they could find this stuff, okay? So now I get done, they wire me up, I'm ready to go out in the street. Now I'm nervous, you know, it's my first day. So I, I walked to the elevator because the FBI was on like the fourth or fifth floor. And one of the guys, FBI guys that watched me get um, wired up was getting on the elevator too. So I, I, I looked at him and I said, uh, you know, you see this watch? I went, now Caldor's was a department store like a, a Walmart or something like that. Yeah. I said, I got this at Caldor's. It's, it's a, um, uh, well, let me think, think of the thing. Like, um, oh. It was like a $30 yeah. Timex. Yeah, a, a 30, yeah, it's a Timex, $29.99. Yeah. And the guy's just staring at me. And uh, so we get on the elevator 
And so I don't know what to say. I'm just looking ahead. He goes, tops wear Timex, the mobs wear Rolex. <laughs> <laughs> so I never forgot that. A $30 watch in 1976, that was an expensive watch. Was, for that's why I was a guy. <laughs> yeah, right. Not for a wise guy, though. You'd stick yeah, out like a, a sore guy. thumb. <laughs> you stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> with the yeah, that, that's for sure. And then here I am. I go out and I'm, I'm hitting all kinds of places. Good. I'm getting the tape. And then all of a sudden they tell me to, uh, all right, now you got to go up to uh, Bridgeport and you got to sit with this lady, the old lady who works for us and you got to get every, she's going to type up all your words and all the words everybody says. I said, how old is this lady? 78. I said, oh, geez. So I go up there and it was a, it was a, um, um, I forgot which, Polish, it was a Polish lady, talk broken English. And uh, so we're down there and uh, she's, she's saying, ah, she kept stopping me. Here I want to get done and get out of there. She says, I, I don't understand, Mr. Vito. Uh, everybody, everybody's telling everybody, make sure you don't forget the ziti and bring the ziti to my house. So maybe what, what, you know, I said, no, no, no. Read that back to me. Yeah. Do me a favor. Call Tony. Tell him to bring me over the eight box of ziti. We got to get going over here. You know, things like that. I said, no, no. What they're, when they're saying that, they're, they're, they're disguising the money for as ziti. They're saying, bring ziti. When they say one box of ziti, that's a thousand dollars. If they right. say five, and I point to her, five would be $5,000. I said, yeah. yeah. You know, so that's, that's good. But, uh, and, it, and it was so funny, you know, because she went so slow and everything else. And I, I told the guys afterwards, hey, I, find somebody else to, to get, get some younger man or woman to, to, you know, type this stuff up, you know, but, but that was, that was, that was funny. But the, uh, the Rolex with the Timex that uh, I get more laughs out of that. When, when how people... long were you on, how long were you undercover for? Undercover? Well, there was two undercovers. There was right. one with the FBI and then it was one after my cover got blown at about a year and a half, I, I did it. And then I go to the chief's office. He says, all right, you know, they, uh, you're all done. Come to my office tomorrow. He, he says, uh, he, was, he was starting, unfortunately, to go wacky. Okay. He says, I want you to still work undercover. I, I said, what are you talking about? It's on front pages. Everybody, what, doing what? They said, no, you know, you still go out, go out and just find, see whatever you can find out about this and that. Uh, uh, so I said, I put my resignation in. I want to get out of this stuff. I said, I got five kids. They're all small. And, and you know, I, I've had it with this stuff here. And uh, no, 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 no. So he, he opens a draw. He says, I got a lot of money here from the state. I'll pay you each week. You just keep going out and doing the, your stuff. I did it for a short time. Every time I told him, that's it. That's it, chief. I don't want to do this anymore. No, no, no. He just like it went, went in one, one ear and out the other. He says, no, no, don't, don't worry about it. You're just, you know, here's the three. He was giving me $360 a week back then, okay, right. which was a, a good amount of money, okay? Decent amount of money. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of crazy stuff. But he was going wacky. He, the, he, he was brought in by the, our mayor, who loved him a lot. He was a great chief out in California and he brought him in and he did a great job initially. What happened though, was he had a fight with the mayor and then he goes and raids the one man team. He went to raid the mayor's house on a Sunday morning <laughs> for no reason at all. He just was going after him. But uh, it's, it, 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 was, uh, it was a bad time back then. And uh, we got a lot done but a lot more could be, uh, could be done. And I tell people now over the last eight to 10 years, there's stuff still going on. It's like, they've almost forgotten this. Everybody says, oh yeah, Vito, you and this one wrote the book. Wow. I said, nobody's scared. Just doing the same thing. We had a, we had a fire, a massive fire a couple of years ago. Uh, Madonna Badger was the lady's name and her three little girls died. And uh, the, 
her father and mother died in the blaze. And uh, half of the house, this big house, half of the house was destroyed, but there was another half that wasn't destroyed. And uh, the state law was that you cannot knock the place down until the state police comes in and does their own investigation. The guy, one of the head guys in the town hall says he bypassed that. He said he took, got two hoodlums with tow trucks. He said, you guys go in, use one tow truck for everything that's burnt and I can't pay you. So take whatever you want that's still, uh, these were multimillionaires. And he just, uh, I go, hey, the, the, nobody's hiring me, nor do I want to get hired again. I said, everybody still uh, thinks they can get away with everything. And it's still going on a lot of different ways. Yeah. I mean, so, there's. Uh... I, I have a question about the chronology. So when you're undercover, I'm assuming this is under the police chief that was not corrupt. Uh, the one at the undercover, no, he was the good guy. Chang yeah, okay. Chang the guy that came in from California. He's the yeah, one because, that came in from California. Because I thought maybe the corrupt guy was the one who blew your cover. Can you can you explain no. how that happened? How you, you yeah, that's, your that, cover that happened. Uh, interesting. I was doing real good on it, getting a lot of information. And uh, the bad guys, I guess all the organized crime had a big picnic one day over one of the guy's sister's house. Okay. And while they were talk, sitting there, uh, one of the guys says, yeah, that Colucci, this and that, blah, blah, blah. He's a, he's a pain in the ass or whatever they were saying. The sister, while she's getting stuff to the table, said, uh, who were you talking about? And they said, Vito Colucci. Now, she worked in the town hall. She made out the checks each week. Oh. Okay. She said, Vito Colucci, I give him, he gets his check every week. From the he police. Said, uh, and uh, oh, so that was it. So now oh, I don't man. know that. The next day, I climb up these stairs, knock on the door to go to the, the poker game. And thank God they didn't let me in because they already knew I was, I, 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 I was uh, bad. I knocked on the door and said, get the hell out of here. We don't want you around here anymore, blah, blah, blah. And I ran down the stairs and got out of there. But they could have brought me in, put me in a car, and uh, it, it was so so funny because all the time I played cards there, everybody was was cool with it, except that there was one guy, really, really heavy guy, nasty guy as can be. And we'd be playing poker and I'd look up, he'd be staring at me and staring at me. And he would, every time he would say, you know, Tony, I don't like this guy here. I don't like him. Uh, leave him alone. Leave him alone. He's not on the job anymore. He's okay, you know, the whole bit. And I, I was saying, oh man. And by the time I get to the card game, I'd be boxed in to the last seat in the kitty corner and with all people around me. So I, I had to get by four or five people if I wanted to leave, you know? <laughs> so, but it, it was a crazy time. Uh, I was glad I was some help in, in, in doing this stuff. And, uh, but a lot of good, honest people came forward and gave information. Anthony Dolan was unbelievable. That's why he won the Pulitzer. And, uh, just, and, and Denny Griffith, just, uh, he's, he had 20 books out. He was a great, great writer of true crime. Can you uh, either Vito, Scott, Joe, doesn't matter, uh... Can you describe the underworld landscape in, in Connecticut? Like, uh, which five families operate there? Do it's the Gen Generation operate operate there? How does that work? It's just, well, all my time, in fact, all the time I, I even think about, has always been Gambino and Genovese. Yeah. That's the main one there. You didn't have the uh, Rhode Island crews or, or, or anything else. Uh, you know, these these guys were, were it. And, uh, you know, I look at, look at my paperwork here out of all the people here. You had Anthony McGalley, you had, then you had the really big people. You had Tommy DeBrizzi, uh, you had, and Tommy DeBrizzi is an interesting one. Because- Yeah, it's in the trunk of a car. Well, yeah, yeah, what happened with him is Gambino boss, John Gotti, one time says, come on in, I, call, call him, tell him I wanna see him. And he doesn't come. 
he keeps telling them, hey, what do you mean he didn't come? He don't want to come. He said he's home with his wife. Oh, you tell him to get over here. He did about four or five times. And then he shot, they shot, he got shot in the face four times. You, you Vito, you mentioned Anthony Magali. I think they called him the uh the genius. The, the genius or the brain. <laughs> he eventually became underboss of the Gambinos, and I believe he was the first Connecticut mafioso to rise into an administration of the five families. Yeah, how he got his name though is interesting. Okay, there was a guy that worked for him and um uh, he uh, he was going to take all the numbers action in the in the football games and everything. So they brought a guy in, an authority on computers, and they uh, taught taught him taught this guy how if the feds come to the door, hit this one button, and it's all going to disappear. Don't put don't write anything now on paper. More you don't write New York Giants minus six eighty times. You just you know, just anytime they come in, you get nervous, somebody's coming in the door, you just hit the button. <laughs> so what happens then, and they they had, uh, after they all got arrested, they went to this restaurant and the, uh, the squad got uh, knowledge of it. So they put bugs under the table. And so they, uh, they listened to it. And McGalley was saying, what did you do? Did I bring a guy in? I pay him tens of thousands of dollars. All you got to do is you're going to hit the bar and everything disappears. You've got it all written out. You got it. Well, I needed a backup. You needed a backup. Like, and and I, I was la I was had tears in my eyes because they brought this guy in, paid him thousands of dollars for all this stuff. And he still wrote it down. That's how the day came. That's how the genius came. <laughs> So did so the other guy Gotti killed him because he was being sent for and he and he was uh sort of being defiant and yeah. uh that that's why that's yeah. why they Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. He wouldn't he wouldn't go in. You don't do that. That might have been the last uh, not the last, it's one of the last uh um Connecticut mob hits. Yeah. Do we, do we know why he wasn't going in? Did he, did he, was he Castellano guy was, or something? Do we know? He just, he was defiant and just said, no, just tell him. See, because he wasn't talking to God. Maybe if he talked to Gotti on the phone. He a couple years him. after Gotti took over. I think it was 88. Uh, let's see if I got that. Yeah, 88, 1988. Yeah. Very good. February 4th, 1988. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. just figured, ah, tell him I'm, I'm busy. I don't, I don't need to come in. <laughs> I think there were a couple incidences like that where uh, there's one where they caught Gotti on a wire saying he was going to cut a guy's head off because oh, he didn't remember uh, that. You know, <laughs> but you know what? People... To eat. Or, no, that was when I think that was when he kept on. I might be confusing situations, but there was one situation where Gotti kept on calling a guy and like it took him like three or four calls to the guy's house for the guy to call Gotti back. And he was well, just like, well, I got to call you four times. He's like, the next time you do that, I'm going to chop your head off. Well, that's that's what happened with the for the, the Brizzy, but he never yeah. went. They right. finally got him in New York and they, they killed him. But you know what makes me, and learning a lot about this stuff, I spoke a lot of places with Henry Hill and I'd see the look on people's faces as they would come up for the autographs and everything afterwards. And uh, uh, Henry did do, drew a lot of pictures, so they would come and buy pictures. They were enthralled by, see, guys, a lot of guys, I learned a lot over the years, a lot of guys would want to be in organized crime. They would love to be in organized crime and go, and go see back at the time front row with Sinatra where they move everybody and they bring tables in and a whole bit. But they're too afraid. They 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 don't want to. You know, I may get killed, or I don't. I want to go to jail. But they want to do that so bad. And and nowadays you hear, oh, in Vegas, it's it's a shame. It, it used to be so good before when the mafia ran everything there. Yeah. And so you know, my point to that is, and I've seen this a lot. So wait a minute. So me, your uncle's store where they went in and they wanted a thousand dollars a week from him. And they beat them up when they could, and, and this one, and that one, that one. So you're okay with all that stuff that happens. You uh, 
You like Bodies that? were popping up all over the place yeah. back then. And then even now, I don't know if you've kept up with it, Vito, but us on the show, we've been talking about it. Over the last year and a half, uh, the, the Lake Mead in Las Vegas is losing water level. And it literally, you're reaching a point where you have over a half dozen bodies that have popped yeah. up and people think it's related to the, you know, the Tony Spilatro rain uh, yeah. there in Vegas yeah. that you saw in Casino. So I, you know, it makes me laugh over this idol, idol this with with idol that. worshiping, yeah, idol worshiping of of the mob. You know, it's uh, I guess because I was on the other side and I worked it, and uh, thank God I think I did a decent job for the time I did it, and uh, and I just uh, you know, you could talk to any of the FBI's or guys like that, and they'll say the same thing. It disgusts them when they see these people glorifying it. You know, but so. Uh... Vito, let's bring Joe in. I'm sorry that it's taken us almost 45, 50 oh. minutes to get to Joe. Oh, uh, you know, but I hear Joe the story is, over and over, and I get chills down my spine. <laughs> Joe's one of the good is one of the good guys, and uh, has worked on a lot of uh, investigations, true crime investigations in multiple states. Um, really, uh, um, you know, digs his heels in and and rolls his sleeves up and. Uh, just it is very thorough. Uh, I consider him a friend. So, Joe, tell us the story of how you got involved in this. I, I was following the Skakel case, Michael Skakel, uh, 1975, Kennedy cousin by marriage, Ethel Kennedy's nephew. Uh, eventually, some four, uh, 25 years later, was they brought charges against him in the Martha Moxley uh, murder. Vito worked on that case as a uh, PI for the attorneys. I wrote multiple stories in Skakel's defense. I read Mark Furman's book. I didn't buy a lot of what was in there. And I continued to pound out articles. Vito came across an article, hit me up on Facebook. We became friends. And this is about the time that Rogue Town comes out. He then starts giving me assignments and asking me to do certain things, which, hey, you ain't telling Vito, no. No, I'm just kidding. Vito's a great guy. He asked me to uh, cover the Aaron Hernandez murder trial. He asked me uh, if I would write book two, which I was completely humbled by. And I said, absolutely. At that time, Denny had not passed away. But then he said, Denny had so much on his table. And I said, Vito, I'll do it. And then Vito became ill. I became ill. And we got behind a little bit. We decided to put edition one back out. And he said, Joe, why don't we take some of what we got for two and move them into this, uh, the uh, revision here of this book. And I said, Vito, if that's the way you want to do it, I, I, I concur. Let's do it. But I met him through the Skako case and other articles I had written. He was impressed with me. He found me. And uh, we've been friends. We've talked to each other almost daily ever since the day we met over Michael Skako. Well, you know, Joe, uh, I just want to, you know, sing your praises a little bit more. Uh, and Benny, you can hit the, <laughs> hit the siren on this. Uh, back when I was making my bones as an investigative reporter uh, on the white boy Rick uh uh, investigation. Joe was one of the early uh, local media outlets here in Detroit that really gave me a platform to get, you know, with a uh, megaphone and start telling people the real story of what had happened to him. If people don't know, White Boy Rick was a teenage FBI informant in Detroit. And uh, up until about 10 years ago, nobody knew the FBI informant part. They just knew that he was a teenage drug dealer um, operating in the late 80s Detroit, which was like, you know, the second coming of Vietnam with the type of violence uh, that was erupting every day. And Rick became kind of a tabloid icon around here, was doing life in prison. And when I hooked up with him about 20 years into a sentence, he told me all this stuff about the FBI uh, recruiting him out of eighth grade seemed crazy, but I was able to verify it really quickly. That story eventually got out to the to the mainstream media. They made a movie about it. We have a documentary on Netflix and he eventually got out of prison. But if it wasn't for people like Joe, who was giving, you know, this was back in the uh, late 2000s, early 2010s. The movie mm -hmm. didn't come out until 2018 um, and he didn't get out until 2020. Uh, but uh, people like Joe were really the catalyst. They got on board and the more traction I got with people like Joe and outlets like Joe, it got out of Detroit and got to the national media. But Joe helped so much with uh, his interest in that case. And we, we probably did a half dozen 
uh, radio interviews and yes, print interviews did. talking about that case. And people like us, me and Jimmy, need to spread the word about people like Vito and Frank. Um, as much as we talk about the actual gangsters and wise guys and mob bosses uh, that are embedded into the you know the fabric of our of our pop culture, um, the, the guys that you you know you saw in, in the movie Serpico or you saw in Copland or you saw in um, um, Donnie Brasco uh, with with Joe Pistone, those guys are the real heroes. And uh, I don't know if people understand that the history timeline and Jimmy can maybe speak to this too. I mean, there just wasn't a lot of investigation into these guys um, until the seventies. And so when guys like Vito and guys like Frank, um, you know, dove into the deep end of an ocean that hadn't really been swam before, uh, I think sometimes you lose context and not to, not to take away on, uh, from the undercover operations that were going on in the, in the nineties in the 2000s and in the 2010s, but the, the undercover ops that were being taken on by people like Frank and Vito in the 70s, it, you, you were so ahead of the curve and it, it seems like it was so much more, not that it's ever not dangerous, but it seems like it was even more dangerous to be doing it when you were doing it and, and putting your life on the line to, to be able to expose what needed to be exposed. Very courageous. Yeah, courageous. Um, and you know what? That makes me, when I jump in to do some work with Vito, give 110% because the man put his life out of life. Always do what he wants to do. And I tell you what, asking me to be part of Rogue Town was one of the greatest things that happened. But back in the 70s, he was doing it. And then Rogue Town, too. He talked about Madonna Badger. That probably will be in book, too, the, the fire he talked about. So uh, he's got me working on some interesting cases, and I'm so grateful. And Scott, you know what's interesting, too? Uh, when Rogue Town came up, uh, I, I heard from a lot of cops, guys I knew, guys I didn't know, uh, going back years, a whole bit. And 95% of them loved what I did, okay? They gave me kudos. Oh, Vito, thanks for what you did, and a whole bit like that. But still, there was a couple people then I, I heard through headquarters, a couple people that said, uh, oh, I don't I don't like Vito. He, he investigates cops. So my, my friend would say, do you realize who he investigated? Larry Hogan and Duke Morris. They killed people. There. Yeah, I don't care, but they were cops. <laughs> so I just have to laugh when I hear something like that, you know? Well, and they Larry have Hogan. their own, I'm sorry to interrupt, they, they have their own omerta, right? The, what is it? The thin blue, the the blue, blue coat or the blue wall. The blue line or whatever they call it. So yeah, yeah. Um, that, um, which is another uh, problem. And, and I would say, I, I don't want to, I, I guess, editorialize here, but it, corrupt cops are worse because they have the sanction of the state, right? Yeah. At least a gangster, you know what you're dealing with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A, a corrupt cop has san official public sanction, which makes them, in my opinion, way more dangerous than a than a gangster. Just like a Larry Hogan, one of the most dangerous corrupt which people is, you could Right, be. which is, he is yeah. one of the big characters in the book. So if you guys go out and get Rogue Town, the, the new... Uh, the new edition with the extra chapters that Joe wrote, you can, it gets into Larry Hogan, man. Uh, that is a, and I hope one day uh, that uh, we were, were just like with Frank Panessa, that we're able to see Vito's story told, whether it be a film or a television show. Um, but Larry Hogan is like, I can just envision that character on the screen um, as being just, an actor that could get a hold of that. And this guy was, you know, there, there was corruption oozing out of his pores when he sweat. You know who he's just like, who I, uh, from the beginning, knowing Larry Hogan, who I pictured playing him, of course, the man had died. You go back to um, um, Rambo, the first Rambo, the guy in the town, the, the yeah, sheriff. Brian, Brian Dennehy. Oh, right. I always had that cocky smile on him. Yeah. You know, that was Larry Hogan. Yeah. Exactly. Looked like him the whole bit. <laughs> you know. So were they was Hogan mobbed up? Was he was he protecting really? yes. Mafiosi? Oh okay. yeah. It was he, he killed people. I mean, and Duke Morris, anytime we would grab somebody on drugs, you know, he, he'd be more worried about uh, you know, well, no, please don't. Don't, don't, uh, give me a bond. Let me get out without any, because Duke will kill me because I don't see, if you didn't work for Duke Morris, 
he would take you in the alley and shoot you in the leg, shoot you in the arm. Eventually, he'd kill you if you uh, refused to work for him. And it, it, this was just, and I talk about in the book, after I, when I realized that, I got Larry Hogan after me. And I'm, I'm parking my car at headquarters, and I'm thinking to myself, this is the safest place, basically, that you would ever want to park your car. But it's not because somebody would put something on my window or do something like that. And I go, is this crazy or not? This is police headquarters. I know everybody's car is here. This, I'm safe here. But no, I come out and there's damage or there's this or that to, to your own vehicle, you know? But that's how bad it was. He was a, he was a bad man. And, and both of them were. They were bad, bad people, bad people. You know, as we wrap up here, this was, I had a, an amazing time doing this interview and I, I know our audience will, will, uh, will love it. And um, let me, let me say, uh, I'm going to say this now and then I'm going to say it again when we wrap up, please like subscribe and share. I promised Jimmy, I was gonna do that at the beginning of the episode and I forgot. So like subscribe, share uh, uh, gangster report or sorry, original gangsters uh, podcast. Uh, and the YouTube channel. So we, you can tell, uh, you can learn and listen to more great stories like we got from Vito. Um, last thing I want to ask, tell us a, about your testimony in front of the commission. Who, me? Yeah. Well, I don't follow. Did, did, you, not, did you not testify in front of the presidential commission for? Uh, oh, no, that Anthony Dolan did that. Dolan did, okay, okay. And Anthony Dolan testified about that. Reagan was running for his first term. And they said Reagan turned all red when he found out about all this corruption and everything like that. And he, uh, he hired him point blank. He still works in, he still works in Washington right now. He's worked for uh, everybody coming through the ranks. Uh, Anthony do you, do you feel like this is your, is this your legacy? I mean, is your legacy the fact that your work created this presidential commission? I mean, you have a lot of a legacy. You have a very layered legacy. But what would you say? You know, is the the well, you, you have a lot of people though too. It, was, it wasn't just me, uh, Anthony Dolan. We're we're a couple of months different in our age. He came on in early twenties. I I was doing this in early twenties, and uh, so he did a hell of a lot. The good citizens of Stanford, the honest ones, came forward and and said, hey. Go in the town hall, open up the file cabinet, look under this, and you're going to see this and that. They did that stuff then too. So, I mean, I I uh, I had it. I I was so angry. I wanted to get them so bad for what they were doing. So I did my share, but still, there were so many people. And Anthony Dolan just pinned them against the wall. He had death threats, and you know, geez. Uh, so that, that's it. I appreciate I appreciate what you said, but there was many people involved. So Frank Panessa, who we've had on as a friend of the show, he did testify before that presidential commission that Scott is talking about. Oh, like who was that? Who, Frank who's... Panessa, Frank former Panessa undercover the DEA. DEA. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. He did testify at that commission. So uh, just as we're as we're wrapping up, Joe and, and Vito, tell everyone where they can uh, consume the uh, get the book. I mean, obviously at, on Amazon, um, but if there's another way for them to uh, to get it, let them know. If they're not living in Connecticut and can't go to a bookstore, well, Joe knows that if it's if it's anybody in the Michigan area, they can see him. He has a, a big supply of books. If not, Amazon uh, is is selling them like crazy. Uh, uh, thank God. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because when the first, I'll tell you quickly, when the first Rogue Town book came out, the uh, Barnes and Noble and the places were calling me. They said, Vito, I need 80 more books. I said, I dropped you 80 yesterday, blah, blah, blah. And so I asked the lady, the head lady, I said, why do you think it's selling that many uh, copies? She said, well, we have so many people, especially ladies that like true crime. So they come in. And they'll look at all the books there, true crime. And then all of a sudden they'll see um, Pul uh, Anthony Dolan wins the Pulitzer. Oh, okay. So a lot of the stuff in this book won a Pulitzer. Okay. And then they say that it, it, uh, it changed around all around a Reagan's thing. It's put new new things in the going. Oh, this is interesting. So this is, this is talking about that. And then on the bottom of the page back then, I had Henry Hill saying, uh, it had my name and he said a little something about me on that too. 
So I think that was a selling point uh, when a guy win, wins a Pulitzer for the stories inside the book. It's kind of like, uh, wow, let me see what's going on. So, but the, the stories were by everybody. It was amazing. It was amazing. So, tell everyone where people can uh, read your stuff and if you want to uh, pitch anything or uh, promote anything. Yeah, if you can find me on Twitter, Joe M. Cochran. You can find me on Facebook as Joe Cochran. Just check me there. Um, it's got my credentials there. Um, also, Joe on the Go website at wordpress.com. I, I plan on putting some new articles up since uh, Vito and I got this book finished. And uh, you can reach me that way. Also, a lot of people in this area, in this tri-county area, I'm, I'm telling you the truth right now. I've had, not, I know this isn't live, but I've had people send me a message. Here's my phone number. I want to buy the book. I'm selling them at book signings and people are meeting me in the area. So I will sell them in person and I'll go a little ways to sell you the book. Yeah. If you're from Detroit or you're from the Michigan area, contact Joe. Uh, Please. If you're, if you're not, go through the traditional channels uh, and, and traditional platforms. This was great. Thank you, Vito. Thank you, Joe. I know the audience is going to love it. And again, we, we tip the hat to the OG law enforcement like Vito uh, who, who paid such a, or who, whose work and uh, service uh, pay it forward uh, so much, you know, the rest of society. And you know, Scott, Joe works very cheap. All he works for is little Debbie cakes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just see some cards. I sent him a box too. <laughs> and and his email, cake email, and his email address is sports tv1000 at yahoo.com. You want to reach me? I'll get you a book of rope now because I feel it's one of the best books I've ever read. Or been a, I'm so glad yeah, to be a part of it. I'm going to show it one more time. Uh, that's the, the book, Rogue Town, 10-year uh, anniversary, new edition uh, with added content is out now. It's been out for about a month or so. 100 uh, more pages in the last 100 more pages. Yep. And, and Rogue Town 2 will follow. Okay, <clears throat> great. Thank you guys uh, for, uh, uh, please remember, like, subscribe, share, uh, we'll keep spreading the word and, and uh, grinding out new content. We're going to be giving you more consistent content. I've been teasing uh, a gear store coming soon, and I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to put that together in the next month or two. I know I said uh, springtime, but I'm hoping now by the end of the summer. Um, yeah, one more thing. I, I've done a lot of, of shows. I've done a lot of things with, with writers, uh, but I got to tell the public listening, uh, this, is a, this is my first time hearing the show. You guys got a, you got something great here working out here with these guys. They do hard work. Well, everything they do is it, this is my most fun, and not only fun but seriousness that I've ever done in an interview. So the folks keep in tune. I don't know if this is weekly or whatever, but keep in tune because these guys are good. They don't. We're honored. We're humble. And the real uh, deal. You know, this show rocks. It, this is great. This is great. Thank you. And, and Vito, I know like, uh, again, Ben can hit the siren on this, but we, we've got uh, uh, listeners and viewers and I believe five or six continents now around the globe. And uh, we're growing, we're growing uh, exponentially every day. And it's people like you and, and that kind of support and that kind of uh, testimonial is, is what moves the needle. So uh, again, we tip our hat to you. Thank you very much, Vito. Um, like, subscribe, share. Scott Bernstein, we'll see you next week on the OG Pod. We're out. Mm -hmm.